And then uh, as soon as it catches my thing here. All right, we are we are live again for another take here, I think. And uh, yeah, this whole thing is, uh, you know, we were just talking offline. It's very chill and experimental still. So I'm sure this won't be the last time we have technical problems, but, but yeah, so, oh, God, um, <laughs> so yeah, we were talking about the SFU degree program and, and how you, you got your start there and I got my start there too. And, um, and we were discussing, um, the, all the interesting people we met. And, and I guess the best jumping off point is just how, uh, how much differently people thought about things there than I was used to, mm. especially coming up in piping. Right. Well, the the program, you know, was specifically oriented towards, I guess it was called the School for Contemporary Arts. Um, and so, you know, in a lot of ways, like music, when you study, when you like, when you study formally uh, music, generally that kind of implies you're studying an old tradition of music. Uh, in, in um, you know, for music degrees and conservatories, you kind of start with music that's about 300 years old or whatnot. Mm -hmm. So, you know, mixing, uh, mixing with um, people that were using new technologies for their art, uh, even just, you know, cameras <laughs> are relatively new compared to bagpipes. Uh, you know, the types of thinking that they would engage in that, the, that like, Oh, the questions they would ask about how their art was was built or ways of re-examining it. It's hard not for that not to rub off on you. Um, you know, as a as a musician to like, well, right, we have all these values in the music that are pretty old, but there's ways of there's new there are new angles, even with some of the same material. Yeah. And like one of the things that was really new to me and quite foreign was like it's almost like you backed into where you would focus technically. So, you know, it's almost like, uh, like I remember that first piano exercise that we had to do in like, you know, music composition 101 or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't even, I don't think it was, it was even technically a composition class yet, but it was just mm -hmm. like, write, you know, write a little piano piece. And I wrote this like technical piece that, that like sounded right down the line. And it was very neat and tidy and I really liked it. And the instructors mm -hmm. were like, meh, all right, whatever. Like B, like that's a that's a B. Like you know, cool, um, nice, nice try, bro. And then and then like the um, you know, and then other people were doing this wild and crazy, you know, stuff that I was not. I was like, what the hell is this? Um, and those were the ones that they thought were kind of interesting. And like you learned, mm. like basically, I was in, you know, you you learned that there were people that actually sought out this program. Like you were mentioning the other uh, mm. last week that you ended up kind of like kind of backing into it from a different, uh, like you were going to be, were, were you studying like chemistry or something you said? Oh yeah. Um, well see, I was interested in experimental music already. Um, and because I was a planned chemistry major, a failed right. chemistry major, um, that, uh, yeah, I just thought scientifically and experimentally about everything. And, um, you know, my first, uh, you know, I was really interested in minimalist music, uh, music that would use drones and uh, a limited selection of notes like the bagpipe. I was well versed in that, but I um, was also getting interested in, you know, uh, this might be a mind blowing composer for a lot of people, but uh, Yanis yeah. Zanakis, who was a, a Greek architect and mathematician composer, you know, he would translate um, what might happen with molecules in a gas when you change temperature in a room, uh, translate that into an orchestra piece. And I was like, wow, this is, yeah. this is amazing to think about mu music built I know. this way rather than like, Oh, what's the story of this piece? I don't know who cares about stories right now, but that was what, the way that I got into experimental music was thinking, Oh, it's a, it's a thought process rather than an expression. Yeah. yeah. It, and it's kind of, and it's like, like I was saying before, it's like totally, totally different i was utterly unprepared uh utterly unprepared <laughs> for that and but you know it kind of fit like you know i learned uh i learned uh like how to expand my horizons uh in a way that i would never get if if i had if i hadn't done the program like i mean even if i had been at ubc which is like sort of the 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 modernist uh 
like school mm -hmm. basically across town, you know, like it was kind of like the sharks and the jets, you know, where they were, they were mm -hmm. doing what you were saying. <laughs> like, not really, you know, like it was fun to, it was fun to occasionally cross paths with those, uh, with those guys over there because they were doing more of what you were saying, like, you know, looking at music from 300 years ago and like learning, learning all right. the different styles and how, to, you know, they were learning about identifying, you know, chord modulations and, you know, uh, right. this, that, and the other thing. And we did none of that unless like, and what I, that's what I was trying to maybe articulate earlier, unless that was like your vibe and that's what you were interested mm -hmm. in, in which case, right. you know, right. in which case the professors would help you like back into the correct technique that you would need to explore mm -hmm. that in like a more legitimate way. Um, right. I always thought right. that was really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was a, it, yeah, it, it, instead of preparing each student um, by making everybody go through, jump through the same hoops that everybody does, counterpoint exercises, writing out all your scales, and yeah, it was like, what kind of music can I start creating, and what sounds am I interested in? And then yes, oh, identify these are the people that did that maybe close enough before you, and they they have it written down in their scores here, and you can go there. Um, it seemed pretty open, but yeah, it was, they were, uh, you know, definitely interested in, let's say, rather than Baroque music theory, they were, they would teach a class on um, atonal music theory, yeah. you know, so it was all like, you know, pitched into a certain camp of, of thinking and ideology. And that's cool too. Um, you know, and I have to, it's gr actually, it worked out great for us because there are very few places that would let pipers in and, and go full into a music degree without having to jump through the already having been raised and with a, a classical instrument and lessons through high school. It's very, it's very difficult for, for non-classical musicians or, or people that hadn't studied jazz proficiently in high school to get into music programs. So for people like us that, you know, worked really hard on our bagpipes and, to play at a high level, like a band like SFU, like there should be uh, more out there to allow us to back into these techniques, to use our our, our um, already, you know, musical skills that are highly developed at that point. Like I just remember my first semester uh, or first summer class, uh, you know, after the first 101, I was like, oh, I'd love to take an elective class with, uh, with Owen. And um, since SFU was sort of on a trimester system, we were like, well, why not? Um, but the only class that was offered was a 400 level, a senior level independent study class. Um, but I was just there doing my first composition class with uh, Owen. And, um, and then David was, you know, David McIntyre was like, well, we know you play on, a, we pull, you play on a 400 level. Yeah. So we'll let you do this class. But um, that's awesome. It, it's very, that, that, that's um, really cool. It's hard. Yeah, it's but it's so hard to get into other forms of music if you come from such a uh, really peculiar and very very hard driven tradition. Yeah, there was a, there were a lot of people like that though. I remember uh, a guy, uh, a guy named James, who was like, he was like into circus stuff, uh, but but oh, that was okay. like his in, and that was his in mm -hmm. to like the theater program. Uh, and he was an excellent musician as well. And like, man, that guy was an interesting guy. And, uh, and he was like mm -hmm. right at home in the program. Uh, and then, mm -hmm. yeah. And then there, there were just, and then there were some people who were there because like they knew this was the place to explore, you know, the experimental mm -hmm. type ideas. And, and, uh, and like, mm -hmm. like I said, at first my eyes would cross over and I would just be like, <laughs> I would just be in complete denial. Like, wait, what, like, what are you like? Um, uh, a, a, a guy who ended up being a good friend, Matt Griffin. I mean, I remember the first like workshop session we showed up to for like composition 200 level or whatever. And like, he showed up with this, like, it was like one sheet of paper with like, I didn't even recognize what, and, and there were like stuff on it. Like, you know, play this, like you won your, you just won your first million dollars or something. And I thought like this guy was just clowning around. And then Owen was like, like, so when you say that, do you mean this? And then he would like play it on the piano. And then like, 
Matt was like, oh, I think I mean like more like this. And, and I don't know, I, I don't remember what the score actually said, but it, it turned out that it was a really like interesting, like way more interesting than, than what I was doing, which was like writing out notes on a page and basically like, basically let's be fair here. I mean, I was trying to get a, you know, a clarinet to play some bagpipe stuff really. It's like basically the extent of my thinking at that point. Hey, well, um, that's what I'm still. Yeah, doing. yeah. <laughs> no, but but you but you've probably, I mean, well, it's definitely progressed from being just something vague to now being like now you have a game plan to approach that, which is the whole point, right? Well, the uh, the one thing that um, you know maybe this this will tie into some other things that we talked about in dojo, but uh, one thing that I had developed at SFU, um, yeah, I think maybe one of their preferences there was that, um, you know, for such a contemporary oriented program, they weren't always embracing composer performer, uh, types of thinking. They were kind of, um, you know, I think because, um, for that type of program and that type of, um, independent mission, it's kind of normal to compose and play for yourself. Um, but they were often thinking like, oh, no, no, you should write this down for somebody else to do it and make sure it's clear. Um, no matter how uh, traditional or forward thinking the idea was. The thing that for me that ended up, um, you know, by the time I graduated, I had this two, this kind of parallel world of like just composing Pibrock, light music, I was like tons of stuff and kind of new minimalist like stuff for the bagpipes but i wasn't really showing anybody that except uh you know like colin mcwilliams and adam quinn and the, you know my buds in sfu um the music that i was writing at the kind of the end of the undergraduate sfu period for me was was very spacious soft um there's a composer named morton feldman who is a cohort of the famous silence composer john mm -hmm. cage was very much taken up with those types of ideas of space and but what i felt at the end of it was that um i sort of like had two things that didn't work together uh a performing tradition and performance skills that were ready to kind of move beyond the traditional notation but also composer preferences that were like i was composing all this other stuff so when i moved on to um study with Anthony Braxton at Wesleyan University was really the first chance to kind of take a lot of those experimental ideas and apply them back to myself on my own instrument. Uh, learning to improvise and to develop new techniques for the bagpipe itself and more specifically for me to actually demonstrate them on recording or in performance. That was an important kind of uh, just massive intersection point for those, those ideas of composing and playing um, to kind of take off. And um, from there, since, since I've still studied other musics and tried to find new techniques to bring into the palette of composing, but um, you know, learning to make the music for myself and on my own instruments and improvising really gave me a, a broad view of to what what could be done in a musical performance. Well, if I think about everything beforehand and note, notate it, that could be done. What if you added another flair that could only be done in real time. Um, that is like, well, what if you combine improvisation and notated music? And there were a number of, of interesting composers that were going in that direction. So, um, which this is a, it's an interesting topic for piping. Cause like, well, how do you improvise on the bagpipes? What do we, what, what do we do? How does, how does one do that? Yeah. And, well, there's um, two, I mean, have, have you done this? Well, I mean, there's two different ways of looking at it, like from the way that we typically understand piping too. Like the first way is the first way of looking at it is we don't do that. Right. Yeah. Uh, which is like, oh, that's just a totally foreign thing. But then like the way I look at it now is that actually making decisions in, in real time is what separates uh, great piping from decent piping. You know, and that even though our notes are clearly laid out for us, typically, certainly if in the in the competition world, uh, you know, I think there are some improvisational things that the top performers like Fred and Stuart Little and stuff like that will do where they're actually changing notes on the fly. Like there's there's a little bit of that. But really, like there's 
there is uh, subtle yet very important improvisational decisions being made, uh, you know, in high level performance mm-hmm. uh, and, and uh, usually just decisions yeah. surrounding phrasing. And certainly when I play, I'll never play the tune the same way twice. Uh, but to be successful, you need to play it in a way that registers with the panel. But but what the judging panel is looking for is some of that material. I've come to really think that and believe that. Um, and then, uh, yeah. And then to a, to a person, a personal degree, I think that's true when you're performing with a pipe band as well. It's not so much you're improvising, mm-hmm. but you do have the ability to make the fine adjustments during a performance because. Mm-hmm. Performances aren't actually ever the same twice, really, when you look at it. And so, no, they, I mean, they shouldn't be. But, um, you know, there's a level of, um, you know, once once you're engaged with another musician, there's always a, a give and take and, and a, a natural uh, breathing room that should be between them. And then that that makes that makes loads and loads of micro moments for for decisions on tempo and phrasing or mm-hmm. or feel. And, um, you know, it shouldn't just be plug and play um but yeah i you know it's tough because yeah like in peep rock uh yeah i always felt like if if my first note was a certain length then all of my other notes were kind of like going yeah. to be affected by that and so often like the whatever the mood of the first cadential rhythm was in the, in, in an erlar um you know I, w- I would let it carry through every decision um you know transitions between the movements um you know doubling singlings that tempo type of stuff and i always felt like that was where like yeah that's the real magic of peep rock is that those transitional transitions between moods yeah and um subtle tempo shifts and um you know i it was like one of these things where like well once you set one decision in motion you have to react to it in real time Otherwise, it's going to be unusable. And it doesn't, like, I think what frustrates me and what's really driven me away from P-Brock, uh, the P-Brock scene, is that, like, mm-hmm. I don't believe that the P-Brock going in a different direction and taking a different form based on something that happened uh, earlier in the tune, like, I don't see that as being a bad thing at all. I see that as being a really yeah. interesting thing. And uh, I like exploring uh, where that goes. And, and it's true. Like sometimes, sometimes it doesn't go in an optimal direction. Like, fine, you know, we can, we can talk about that, but you know, um, and then that's what um, I got your book out for the conversation. But I mean, like that's, (laughs) you know, you talk so much about Joseph McDonald in this book and, and to me, like the, the greatest significance there is it, it's like uh, it is, the purest, like it's the purest picture we have of maybe what P. Brock used to be about, uh, which, right. which to me, like, I, I think I'm biased because I want it to be true so much. So, so you know, mm-hmm. so take what I say with a grain of salt, but like, like Joseph mm-hmm. McDonald is saying, like, P. Brock used to be what you're talking about, which is, you know, actually mm-hmm. making decisions in the moment as to how the tune might go. Yeah. And, you know, uh, maybe playing a, a, you know, Terra Lewis singling variation, but maybe not, uh, you know, maybe playing yeah. a thumb variation, yeah. maybe not, uh, you exactly. know, reaching up and retuning your drones in the middle of the tune because, you know, your drones have drifted slightly and like, you know, uh, uh, mm. and, and, and like expecting uh, performers to play tunes in different ways. And, you know, all this stuff, all this stuff that makes total sense. Like, like if you listen to, you know, uh, we were just listening to the Mumford and Sons version of, uh, the boxer during class earlier today. But I mean, like, you know, that that's like a classic song and like people like redo it and it's similar, but it's different depending on that person's style and blah, blah, blah. But like, I think P rock should be that way. And I think that there's like real precedent for that that has been paved over. Well, well, anybody that, that has ever played at a funeral should knows that these things don't go as planned. Uh, you know, often some of the signaling, you play more and more and then, or like, Oh, and uh, you know, I, I just, I got a funeral last week, hadn't played one in, in over a year. And they're like, Oh, we'll play, play when they're putting, you know, uh, putting the, sarcophagus into the chamber or whatever and i was like i I always tell my students this like you know say you're at a funeral and 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 the the coffin falls and they have to put the body back in or whatever and it's just okay you throw in another variation yeah. 
you have to keep it going. So that's what, like, I always thought of people are, and, you know, actually, this is the thing the it kind of blew my mind once to go to the College of Piping and see the actual molds, the presses for the Binius, uh, Binius book, that they, they, they had them there. There were just these little blocks and they were separate blocks and they were separated by phrases. And I just got this idea of like, wow, this is great. What if we really did think about, and this kind of ties into some of my early like traversing Manhattan pieces. What if we did just think of this as like a deck of cards that we can collect some and use some of this musical material, but in, in your own arrangement, yes. you know, as, as a performer, you're in a real context and you're there to decide whether or not the performance should continue or not. Competition is like just presents some sort of other, um, you know, sort of idealistic like abstraction of what the music is really about. Or music is really put into play when it's performed for somebody in its purpose. You know, like for a dancer or for a funeral yeah. or whatnot. And yeah, your job is to keep the music going. So yeah, throw in a thumb variation. Throw in the Krunla. Uh, you know, or don't go to the Kroon Law if it's a pretty, pretty uh, uh, morose situation. Um, yeah. Or feel free cutting off right after this. So I, I feel like the idea of the music as being a, a set of materials that you can put together to make a performance and the choice is in construction. That's up to you. There's no, it's not up to the composer. Yeah. The composer put the materials out onto the table. Then you can you know, they kind of create the menu. The performer is there to sort of put it into action. Um, and I feel like, uh, oh, there's also another thing about the Joseph McDonald book that when we're talking about the liveness of improvisation, um, it's the first book to, and one of the most extensive, it's very, it's just a chapter, talk about playing in, a, in, in an extemporized way. It's called, um, uh, Duke and Glaze, also, it's kind of the well, he, he, it's a Gaelic term for testing out the pen. You know, when you have an old quill and you have to test out the pen to see if it works before you write something. That's kind of like the whole tradition that we have around tuning phrases yeah. and chanter warm ups and whatnot. Like, we all have the ability to construct interesting musical gestures and events prior to the tune. And, and um, Joseph McDonald writes about it, and other writers since then have tried to kind of pick up on what he was talking about. But, I, but at that point, the, you know, the, the Highland Society of London competitions have already been started. And, you know, the, when you're looking at uh, Donald McDonald books, they came out well after that process. Yeah. Began. And then, so yeah, the Joseph and McDonald. Then I was just oh, going to say yeah. like the, like almost instantly, as soon as the, you know, the Highland Society of London got involved, like almost instantly there were ulterior motives in, in the, yeah. in the um, progress of the music to the point where like, yeah, to the point where, where we're still kind of living in like this weird, like, I don't know, is there a single performance instrument that's been as politicized and as used as our instrument? I don't know. It's crazy. Mm. It's crazy. Mm. You know, like, you know, it's all, I mean, and, uh, and in, in that sense, now we're getting on to like, uh, uh, William, William Donaldson's books, right. Where like, mm -hmm. right, where right, it's right. like, uh, I don't know. The bottom line is the Highland society of London was really interested in motivating Highlanders to get involved in the military. Right. And like mm -hmm. there's, so they're sponsoring competitions to make that happen. I mean, that's a very, very, right, uh, right. abbreviated, uh, it's it, it was also an attempt uh, on, a, on a it was kind of a colonization effort as well on the parts of the British yeah. to um, to just to continue to 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 ha because who was judging these competitions? Uh, the judges were were usually landed gentry from England, and maybe they might have had some musical training, but but uh, that's why there was such a pressure to produce yeah. musical notation was that. There weren't the judges were not performers. And and Joseph McDonald, I mean, he produced it with no expectation of much other than that it would be uh hopefully published. But like he wasn't, you know, he wasn't approached by anyone to write this. I think he was just like genuinely passionate and curious about the music. Absolutely. I think he was um 
he, he was a little bit of, um, I'm sure that he came. From, oh, he um, came from a lot of money. He came from so, a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. So, he, you know, he was in Edinburgh and, um, you know, was classically trained. That just signals, oh, yeah, you, you had money. Um, classically trained, you know, on all these other Baroque instruments. And, yeah, you just uh, whip away to the Highlands for the weekend and, and uh, you know, study this music. And, I, I, yeah, I thought it, he was very young when he died. So it was, it was definitely a, uh, a passionate gesture and uh, incomplete. Uh, you know, since it's complete, it says it's complete. It actually was incomplete, and that was there was a, supposed to be a subsequent music collection to come with yeah. it. And um, well, and then like, you know, and then it sort of got it sort of got uh, chopped up and sort of rebuilt uh, before it was published in its actual original form, right? Something like that. Yeah, it had been uh, published a, a few times, and they had uh, in 1803, and also there was a, a Peabrook Society version that came out in the 70s, and you know they they um this they struggled to notate all these new things, um, you know that they weren't used to notating when they when they went to printing press versions of it, and what they the Peabrook Society version, the edited version, have, has really tried to. Um, just sort of think about the magic of, of manuscript writing versus, uh, you know, typed text. Mm -hmm. So they, you know, they have a facsimile of the, of the quill of the manuscript and, um, you know, and then when they reproduce it, they try to do it in a handwritten style. So it's kind of mm -hmm. nice. Um, it gives a little bit of that antiquity. So, um, but, um, you know, the, I think the text edits were pretty poor in the past because it was a kind of an old English that when they, typed out the text there were loads of errors so it, it needed a new it needed a new face in the night and it's just like man the irony just really like it's it's just out of control in so many ways like you know now and again i don't speak for all p rock scholars but like there's definitely that tendency definitely when you're in the competition sphere when you're in the the, the competition mm -hmm. club playing at the highest levels it's like there's this idea that anybody knows exactly how the tune should be played. Um, and it's so <laughs> utterly ludicrous and, um, mm. and it's just unbearable sometimes. And then like, you know, yeah. you go around the scene and, and uh, I was a good, like when I played in the silver medal, that was a good competitor. I, I, I took five prizes in six attempts or something, uh, but I, I didn't win mm. it. And the people who won it, there was just like this thing and it, it bothered me. And I don't know, we could maybe dig down into the psychology there, why it bothered me. Maybe it's just because I wanted to win. But also it's like, there, it's like this thing where people are like, oh yeah, so-and-so just, they just have it. They just have it. And boy, they just, they really got it today. And, and like with the implication, both A, that they just magically have this thing and that B, mm -hmm. you don't have it. Which, you know, which is like, okay, but like, <laughs> but like, you know, explain this to me. Uh, you know, like, right, right. well, and anyway, uh, I can explain it. It's just that you're, when you're, when you're only showing up for two weeks of the year, nobody's yeah. welcome to and you. I mean, I think yeah. that's, I think that's just it. Like, <laughs> I think if I was doing my thing with, with a, a deeper brand, because people knew who I was, uh, would I have won the silver medal long ago? And the answer is, I think probably maybe yes. I mean, like, and again, this isn't about me saying woulda, coulda, shoulda. It's just like, like there's something weird about it. And maybe it just is branding. But uh, I remember right. the, the fifth time, I remember the fifth prize. So uh, I had three years where I played the silver medal. And at the end of the third year, mm. I remember talking to a judge I really, really respect. And, and, <laughs> and basically, you know, we pass each other. Um, it would have been an Oban, I guess. So it, it couldn't have been the, the fifth, maybe it was the fourth time. And, uh, and anyway, I was, and he was like, Oh, you almost had it today again. You know, you must be tired of getting third places. And I was like, yeah, basically I kind of am like, you know, and he was, he judged me that day. And I was like, so like, what is it that I need, you know, to get from fourth, you know, to, to winning it. Uh, and, and he was just like, you know, just, just got to keep at it. And then, you know, cause he knew there's no, there's no real straight answer. And, and once it gets to a certain point, it's just people kind of saying like, Oh, like he has it or he doesn't or she, he or she. Right. Um, 
Well, sometimes you know, the more familiar they become with you as a player, then, the, then you know, I always felt like, you know, just this is post facto because I felt the same things like, well, what's the difference? You know, like, like the, that's the most unmusical performance I've ever heard. Like, how could you, how could you award that? Uh, you know, I, you know, I, I felt I, I enraged a, a lot, you know, like my, my, uh, see, I was, uh, let's say, let's just say that Peabrock was always my strength, not that I couldn't play light music, but, um, uh, you know, I was a finalist in the, the knockout first, first time in Vancouver, but, um, Peabrock was gen generally my prize, you know, the prize money was better. So I worked Very harder practical. at it and, um, yeah, exactly. You know, my, my silver, my silver medal year, you know, this was a mistake. The year, this was the year that they made silver medalists learn six out of the eight tunes and they never went back to it again because they never had so many note errors, consistent note errors throughout yeah. the entire event. Um, so, but, um, anyway, I would just say, like, I used to do pretty well as in, in open p uh, you know, and, uh, even, on, you know, I would, beat Stuart and Alan occasionally because I would go for the music. I would just go right. for it. I would do the musical thing. I would pick tunes. I would pick tunes that express my personality and uh, would do something with it. And so like a guy like Jamie Troy would a judge like that. He'd, he'd throw me in first, even, you know, even if I had five yeah, yeah. friend Lewis. And, and so that, so I went in that direction and then when silver metal time came around, it was just like, you know, I just gave up the one thing that was, that was giving me the competitive edge, which was just like, like a musical yeah. engagement. And, um, so that year it's just like tons of comments. Oh, you're doing it wrong. 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 Yeah. You're doing it wrong. Like, okay, I'm out of here. I don't want to do this. Again. It's a, um, <laughs> it's a, it, yeah, it's very frustrating. And, uh, it's almost like, you know, and, I don't want, you know, and it's not to disparage people who succeed in this, you know, the people who win are usually very good, but the, it's like, for me, it's very clear. Uh, it's very clear that like the silver medal isn't really about, you know, because it inverts, it inverts at the top. I think that's what's even more in, or adds to the, like the, 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 like you said, like it makes, it can make you feel angry. And by the way, it's like, you know, uh, especially for me, it's like, I'm investing weeks away from home. I'm, I'm putting, you know, potentially my career and my family on hold. This is eventually, this is ultimately why I stopped doing it. It's like, Oh, you know, mm -hmm. like I want to build like we were building a local band at home and I was, you know, hoping to start a family and a business. And so eventually it was like, I just can't do this. Uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, but then it inverts at the top. Like the silver medal is almost like, a. it's, a, it's more of like a, uh, initiation it's bottleneck. Yeah. It's like an, it's more of an initiation than it is a competition and it's really bizarre. And it like was such that, you know, like silver medal is to prove like you can play the way we, we want it. Right. And then at that yeah. point, if you can play the way we want it and we decide it's your year and, and mm. it, the, we could be anybody and you could get lucky and get a sympathetic panel or you can be unlucky. And it's like, you know, um, and then, uh, like, if, if you can play it the way we want it, then when you get in the gold medal, you still have to basically play it like we want it. But then if you get to right. the big leagues, then you can start to change it. But at that point, like, how much are you really going to change? Um, right. But, like, you you would see that. I remember one year at Inverness, the person who won the clasp had uh, several clear misses of technique. Mm. Mm. Uh, that mm -hmm. if you had those in the silver medal, um, y you know, they wouldn't even they wouldn't even listen to you. Right. No, no, it's a, it's a thing about it's a it's a it's an it's it's a rite of passage that we're we're then now mastery is allowed to forego the perfection of technique. Yeah, and that only happens in the class, and it's a low. It's I don't know. It's, it's well, it's crazy. You know, it, it's I mean this, it, it's limiting a lot of musicality. I I just felt like um, so when I did just a harp on the silver, you know, I went and studied with Angus McClellan. Um, prior to my silver and um, you know, I would get this type of thing like um, like I would play him Hector McLean's warning or something like that. One of those, you know, rhythmic tunes. And he like one of the best compliments I've ever had in my life. This is just says, that's the best I've ever heard that tune ever mm -hmm. by anybody. 
and then go play it in Inverness and with with the flu and just yeah tanked, you know like and mm-hmm. i played it exactly the same way <laughs> maybe i've had i think because i had the flu i missed like a few criminals in the last line and just like stamina it's you know? uh it's so frustrating. I mean, I went back, I played the silver medal in 2017 and, uh, um, Oban was okay. And I made, I made what I would consider to be, you know, crucial tempo error. So by the time I got to the end of the tune, I was admittedly going too fast. So fine. No prize there. I play, I thought I played pretty well, but you know, yeah. definitely way too fast. Fine. And then Inverness was just like, you know, and I struggled with this, you know, I was away from my family for two weeks, mm-hmm. just basically like, you know, uh, uh, couch surfing in Scotland for two mm-hmm. weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, I got to Inverness and I was on sixth or seventh and the tuning room could not have been more than 55 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh yeah. And yeah, then, if, yeah. you know, and it was a cold morning, right? And it was mm-hmm. a cold morning. So in the performance room, they literally had the heat cranked on the curtains. The curtains were blowing from the heaters. Um, and so it must, it couldn't have been less than 80 (laughs) degrees in the room. Um, and it was just like, I, uh, I was checked by the time I started my tune, I was checked out. There's just no chance. You can't, you can't take a bagpipe from 55 degrees to, uh, 80 degrees, uh, in a four minute window. Uh, and then, you know, you just can't like nobody can. And sure enough, all the prizes were from the second half of the day because the, you know, the temperature had warmed up in the tuning room Mm. and what have you. And it's just like, that's two weeks. Like that's two weeks of lost family time, lost productivity time, uh, you know, right. costs of living in Scotland. And, and then like, yeah, so the conditions were humiliating there too, mm-hmm. you know, and obviously I didn't, I didn't play well. I mean, I'm not saying, I'm not saying I would have played better than everyone uh, had the conditions been right. That's not really what right. I'm saying. What I'm saying is like, mm-hmm. I don't know. It doesn't work they're, for me. They're not, a, the conditions are not always fair. And uh, you know, for how much emphasis that is placed on the tuning of the instrument these days, the conditions are totally inadequate. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know. We could go on forever about tuning and performance. The, um, the, the common, and then I've been to the CPA meetings too. And like sentiments like what I'm expressing now would be seen as whining and everybody has the same conditions. (laughs) So like, you're just a whiner. Like that's, that's how it's been written off as long as I've, you know, as long as I've been around to voice some of these concerns, it's just like, well, you know, this, the local people, the local Scottish people that play in the silver medal, they have the same challenges to deal with. It's like, no, they don't. and even yeah. if that's true, that's completely not the point. It's like, they're just going down the road. Yeah. You know, well, and that's just it. You know, if you're from, <laughs> if you're from Scotland, if you go bomb in the silver medal, uh, for whatever reason, like you, you just kind of go home and you regroup for next time. You, you, you're you right. not saving 10 grand to be able to right. afford next season. Yeah. Uh, it's totally yeah. different. Uh, yeah. um, it's totally different. And there's like a, there's, there's the devil may care approach that you're able to take uh, when you're preparing for the silver medal uh, as a local player uh, mm-hmm. that you cannot take. So anyway, I don't know. We ended up down this deep rabbit hole. Uh, but oh, uh, that's fine. No, but but uh, you know, I think it it leads it 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 does have a positive outcome because I think um, for me, like uh, you know, we touched on this in the the dojo class, but you know, your old teacher Jim had 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 I read read an interview with him very early on in my piping career, and like, well, for pipers, the competition seems to be the end of the road, but this is just the just the doorway for yes. most musicians is to get through their competitive cycle and to start a professional career. Now, not, not too many people were doing uh, bagpipe new music, uh, so I really, really had a, had some issues with the whole competitive thing. Uh, I had major issues with, with how music was just frustrating to, to get to that musical ecstatic moment of expression, the type of thing, you know, yeah. like at a rock show where people say, that thing, that thing, that, that, that final thing that music does for us, like, how do we get to that? Except for being frustrated by not getting a prize. So, you know, I just, and it's a false took, bill of goods, like, direction. like just to pick up on, on what you're saying, you know, my whole youth, when I grew up, uh, it was with romantic visions of playing at Oban and Inverness in mind, you mm-hmm. know, when you take lessons and you'd hear stories 
of, you know, all the great players and how they produce legendary, per, legendary. And like you said, expressive, like, mm-hmm. like super romantic, wonderful performances that just moved the masses mm-hmm. like to such an incredible degree that they won the big prize. And that's what you're right. being sold. Um, and I don't think it's in a nefarious, like, I don't think it's in a, in a, I don't think it's being sold to you on purpose or for, you know, mm-hmm. for any, in any conspiratorial way, but it's like, but that's what you have in your mind. And then, man, I just really felt like, I just really felt all of that, like being rapidly drained out of me as, as you know, okay. once I actually like earned my way onto the scene, um, And I remember, you know, like I was going to play in the gold medal the next year, which I did not know, but I, you know, I got a nasty gram from Jack Lee at one point who had advocated that I need to play in the gold medal, even though I had never won the silver, you know, pointing Mm -hmm. to, you know, five prizes and six attempts, like this guy's the real deal, but I didn't apply for a CPA membership that year. I was done. Mm -hmm. I was done. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it wasn't going to happen. I was too, like, I was too deflated. And, and again, to be clear not deflated that I didn't win, but just <laughs> deflated that, that like that, that like no one could tell me why. And, right. uh, and the, the experience, it was fun to play at a high level, but it, and, but then, but then you're just wandering in the dark afterward, you know, and yeah. you sort of get score sheets there nowadays, but like, not really. No. And then, you know, you don't really, you know, I put a lot of time into my education and learning how to talk about music. You don't really get any feedback from so many, many of these people. You get the va- this, the vaguest tone of like, yeah, oh, you just keep on it or, you know, yep. watch your G and your D and your E and you're good. You know, like. <laughs> it's like there's the got to be more insight. to it. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so, you know, uh, it, I feel like when there's uh local players there that just people can get to know them and get to know their ups and downs and then when you come for one prepare one one performance and people don't get to know who you are it's kind of it's hard for people to be uh just as a listener this is just an experience of 20 years of just doing music and trying to get an audience yeah like when people judge you it, it audiences are harder they have to they they can walk away yeah. You know, like a judge has to sit there and write things down and figure out something about you. But, um, you know, I just, there's more there. We, we, we got to do another one of these things where we can get into all the, you know, the uh, things yeah. that are possible when we, when, when you just let the competing thing go. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, I think, I think that's exactly right. I think I'm still, I, I still struggle with it. I, I still love the bands, but, um, mm. you know, like the bands, cause I'm kind of into it. Like I'm into the bands are cool because I'm into the training and mm-hmm. performance. I'm into that, you know, like right. I'm not the best at it, you know, like oh. Callum Beaumont will always be always, he'll always be a better performer <laughs> than me. He and I are, are good mm-hmm. friends. And like, you know, mm-hmm. he has, he does have that, like that performance edge that I'll mm-hmm. probably never have, but I'm very into it. Like I'm into mm-hmm. like how to prepare, how to visualize, yeah. uh, you right. know, uh, making it happen, preparing the right way. So like in that respect, you know, playing MSRs over and over again in the pipe band realm, like actually kind of appeals to me now in a sick mm-hmm. kind of way. Mm-hmm. Um, and then oh, the medleys, you know, and then the medleys, like I'm, I'm always uh, like to a borderline probably beyond borderline annoying way. Like I'm really into the creativity aspect of the yeah, medleys yeah. and like putting together the, the Hollywood feature film medley sort of mm-hmm. like, uh, you know, like making, making the square peg fit into the round hole kind of thing with right, the medleys. Right. And that's fun. So I, I still very much enjoy, uh, you know, pipe bands. Uh, but then, yeah, from a, from a solo, I, I can't picture myself going back to the solos. I never say never, but yeah. Well, yeah, I never, I said I'd never go back. And then I did it a couple of times just to kind of, for myself, I just l- love to continue to play and play this music for my own needs. But um, uh, yeah, just running back into the same issues. Like, yeah. well, how, to what level am I going to do this uh, again? Like, am I going to go for gold? And uh, I just kind of feel like, um, you know, there's plenty of people to go do that. And um, I, I've kind of pigeonholed myself a little bit into this. Uh, well, I I play in all these sorts of ways, and a lot of it sounds noisy. And and the biggest thing for me is like, I think, you know, 
I mean, th this is a big musical decision, and it's a classical, jazz, anything, any kind of music you decide to do. How clean do you want it to be? And is that necessary? Uh, yep. I have gotten very much into dirty musics, um, you know, distorted guitar, uh, free jazz, overblowing saxophone, extended techniques on the violin, this type of thing where there, there are, there's a whole range of sound beyond just playing the clean way. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's like kind of, once you go dirty, you can, it's like kind of hard to go back. You spend forever just trying to get clean again. Yeah. Um, but I enjoy playing P rock and light music and it's a regular part of my uh, practice routine. I think that's the key I, thing. I, I think, I, yeah, that the, the enjoyment is the key thing. Mm -hmm. Well, we, I, you know, we both did, we did SFU, so we have to love that, pre that preparation yes. band, getting the sound. See, for me, the, the band thing that I always love, and I, I just feel like maybe competition wise, it's, we go too far down the deep end of tuning, but it's so fun to make, to, I know. to set up a band. Yes. I love That's, it. I love the channers, the drones, getting it all, getting it in their heads and making it all peak at one moment. Yes, exactly Beautiful. right. And and it's like you say, I think it's, I don't know, you kind of have to, I don't know, to be big time, you kind of have to pick a specialty, don't you? Like, you know, to, yeah. to actually for it to be good. And I think, you know, that's, that's one of the decisions for me. It's like, well, uh, like at the level that I want to teach at and, the, and the, um, the, the magnitude, the magnitudes that I want to reach from a teaching perspective, mm -hmm. it also kind of forces the you know, like Bruce Gandy and I, uh, talk about this all the time. He's like, mm -hmm. he's like, God, how many hours a day do you spend teaching? And then, you know, cause he, he wants to do more, but he teaches one-on-one -on -one a lot. And then he still mm -hmm. has to reserve hours, yeah. plural per day for his own personal playing. And for I'm me, it's right. not that, you know, for me, it's, for me, it's five to 25 minutes a day of practice probably mm -hmm. on the, yeah. and that's yeah. probably it. And, uh -huh. and it's because, I've chosen to specialize on, on the business and like reaching more people with the teaching. And anyway, mm -hmm. uh, um, we should uh, have a, to be continued here because yeah, I'd we, love to, this is all good stuff. I mean, we haven't even touched B flat yet. So. I know we got to do, <laughs> but see, like, it's probably good because, um, especially once I post, uh, the, the clips of me and Rad Matheson talking about B flat, I mean, people are going to be sick of hearing about it. Um, uh, but oh, we won't. I'm determined yeah. though, by the, by the time COVID is over, the um, the RSPBA will have decreed that uh, everyone's going to be playing in B flat when they come back, and oh. uh, no, no, that's totally not going to happen. Uh, I got to find I, I, I got to find someone in the inner circle. Um, I see. I I love the B flat channel, and I have I only have one of them, and I have about twenty other pitch channers. So that I feel like uh, the B flat. If you want to work with other musicians, there's no other way to go. Yeah. Um, if you want to, you know, but the I don't know. The, it's so tied into a, a pipe band selling of chanters. Oh, this this year's this year's model is is a tiny bit sharper. <laughs> buy this one. There, there Actually, your whole band a, should buy one. There might be a little <laughs> bit. There might be a little bit to that for sure, uh, but probably not as much as you think. I mean, I don't know. Maybe. Oh, it happens in other music. Oh, for sure, it happens. In, Brightness, brightness is one of the big, I mean, it happens in or, European orchestras too. Like yeah. they're not at 440 anymore. They're up at 446. So, I mean, these things happen. It happens in Bali. The, uh, you know, standardized tuning has become more prevalent um, there. And actually what's happened is this less timbral diversity. Uh, anyway, I have a lot of thought, a lot of thoughts about tuning. and We can certainly go in that direction. And it would be a, uh... I think a person like you could be instrumental in actually putting together like a, what would they call it in the tech world? Like we got to put together a white paper on this. Like, so, so all <laughs> the facts, so all the facts are there. Cause like, right, right. The, if we don't, if we don't uh, standardize our pitch, you know, uh, there's precedent for this and there's reasons why countless other, uh, you know, idioms have gone to standardize pitch. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it will increase, uh, the interfaceability of us with the wider world of music, which is something we desperately need. And I also suspect, oh, yeah. I also suspect it's one of the reasons, it's one of the reasons we're afraid to go there is because mm -hmm. we're going to have to like admit that, you know, musically there's a lot left to be done 
uh, in our, our, I mean, just like, just compare the worlds to, um, you know, the, the Baghdad championships, like Mm. musically, I'm sorry. I love medleys and I love, I love all the bands and I love all the judges and everything, but like musically there's no comparison. It's, it's borderline embarrassing how great the bag ads are compared to uh, what we're doing. And, and it's not to say we have to play in that style. Uh, but, uh, we need, we need some opportunity to branch out. Very, very, yeah. Like even the the Donald McLeod theme medley that, that we did with Metro, that even that was like really bothering people. Yeah. Oh yeah. And and there's the whole like, yeah. And then, and then there was the whole Toronto police thing. And I I've gotten a chance to talk with Michael Gray a little bit about that, but I want to talk with Mm -hmm. him more about that. And it's like, Hmm, uh, based on what we're trying to do, with medleys, like, okay, maybe it's not the best way, uh, or maybe that's not the best venue to do it, but like, where do, where can we do it? Like, where can we try new ideas in a way where people are like, Hey, that's a really kind of interesting idea. Like, I don't know. I don't know. Well, uh, concerts, yeah. concerts and, and, uh, you know, entrepreneurship was, uh, you know, getting performing outside of the comp- competition arena. You get a lot of people that are like, wait, wait, wait what are you doing? Wait, that's bagpipes. I, I've run into a lot of people that wouldn't, would never know that there was a bagpipe competition to go to. So, so part of it is looking in other places for potential audience people. But, yeah. uh, I don't know. I mean, the tuning thing, I don't, I don't know as an outdoor instrument, I don't understand why people, the, uh, the interest is to continually moving into higher and higher pitch. It's just, yeah, for it's me, crazy. it's just like when you have, look at your waveforms, look at your, your, your wavelengths, the lower you are, the, f- the further the wavelengths travel. And um, so if you want, hmm. that's why the, the instruments are kind of having to get louder and louder too. It's just that higher pitch, hmm. tra- the pitch travels, it doesn't travel as far. Yeah. So they have to be louder and you have to have more players. But lower pitch and softer instruments and, um, uh, you know, six players or 12 players like the old good old Strathclyde. All right. We have to stop. Right? You're going to get me in trouble with the masses uh, because. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're a quarter two. Yeah. Okay. And I, I need to run, too, because if I don't, I'll get you fat. gym thing. Yeah. Don't um, get fat on this. <laughs> do it anyway, here on the internet. Yeah. Uh, uh, food for thought and for the next one, too. To we be can, continued. Yeah. We're going to pick up totally. exactly here because, uh, yeah. And uh, so let's, uh, we'll work together. We'll, and maybe across the next month or two, we'll find a space where we can uh, make it things work. Get, things get uh, a little more open late May. Late May. Sounds, like, sounds yeah, good to like me. Maybe two, two or three weeks from now. Um, well, yeah. And it can coincide because you, you were uh, kind enough to read my book too. So we can chat. We should chat a little bit about things here and there because yeah, that'll be, be closer great. to the actual release date of the book as well. So. Sure. Yeah. And good job on the book. Yeah. There's a lot of a lot of things I've discovered in my own time, and especially the grace note layering and rhythmic stuff. Like, don't you got to be able to play this tune with the single grace notes, and then add the doublings, and then I, like I do it myself mm-hmm. routinely. Play it, play a two, first pass of the first part, single grace notes. Next part, doublings, and it's just like simple stuff. So it's good. It's good to see it all in one place. So. I hope, I hope it's super effective for people. Yeah, I hope so too. Well, anyway, until we meet again, thanks for, uh, thanks for meeting up.